here is my chapter summary for John Batista, College of Physics, Chapter 19, Magnetic Fields and Forces. It, this is a pretty beefy chapter, um, so we're going to try to make it as, as nice as possible. Uh, and I want to do that by first flashing back to this, right? Suppose I have a positive charge. Well, then I have, it creates an electric field. That's kind of a big deal. E. So, electric charges make electric fields. On top of that, if I have an electric field, and I'm just drawing a constant one just for fun, and I put a charge in there, let's put a negative one in there, then there will be a force. So, if you, electric charges make fields, and if you put a charge in an electric field, it gets a force, right? And so, we could, we could create an equation for this. Um, the force is uh, Q times E, and if Q is negative, it's in the opposite direction. But that's where we had. That's what we had so far. For me, one of the biggest ideas in the second semester of college physics is the electric field, check. It's applications, electric circuits, electric current, and magnetic fields. It's all about electric and magnetic fields. So now we get to look at magnetic fields. So let's just start. The book does things a little bit different, but I want to start off with a demo because that's what I like. This is a magnetic compass. That way, actually is north. Okay, sometimes it doesn't point, point north. So a magnetic compass is a magnet. Oh, I dropped. I had a magnet already and I dropped it. I have here, let's put this right there, I have here a terrible magnet, but you can see that this bar magnet does something to that. So we could say this bar magnet creates a magnetic field, and this magnet in the, in the presence of a magnetic field experiences some interaction, uh, and that's kind of cool. Now, I'll tell you the truth. These bar magnets... Uh, permanent magnets, we call them, they're not easy to explain uh, why they are the way they are. And we'll talk about it a little bit, but actually an easier, this is kind of fun, an easier uh, example of a magnetic interaction, not from a magnet, I'm going to move that away, but from something we've already seen, electric current. So let's do this. Why is that not pointing in the same direction? Huh. That's weird. Well, well, we'll deal with it. So I want to show you what happens if I take an electric current. I'm going to pass this wire directly over that compass needle. Right that. Okay, so the needle's right below there. And I'm going to connect this. I'm going to touch it. And so you can see that when there is electric current going through the wire and, and I connect the, the battery, there's a compass deflection. So that implies that the moving charges in here must create a magnetic field. And if moving charges create a magnetic field, then magnetic fields should experience, should, should push on moving charges. Okay, and that's the key. So electric charges create electric fields, but moving charges create magnetic fields and therefore magnetic forces. So the first thing we need to know, know is this idea of B. B is what we represent with the magnetic field, magnetic field. Um, e has units of volts per meter. The magnetic field has units of Tesla. Okay, we just call it T. Now, if I have a magnetic field then this one's kind of wild. We can write the magnetic force, F, as Q times the velocity vector V cross B. And this is something really weird, right? Up here, this is just Q as a scalar multiplied by a vector. They're in the same direction or opposite direction because it's easy to do. But how do you do this? What the heck is that? Now, you may have seen a cross product before uh, when we talk about if you did torque you don't always get to torque, but torque and technically angular momentum are both cross products, but this is a cross product. And the thing is, how do I operate two vectors together? And I'm not going to go over all the details because this is an algebra-based course. 
it's a super awesome thing, but we're going to do it in an easy way. So the cross product, if I have two vectors, we do need this a lot though. So let's take two vectors, uh, vector A cross vector B equals vector C. So the first thing is that the operation of these two vectors gives another vector result in a vector. And you'll notice that, right? Because B is a vector, the velocity is a vector, and I, I need force as a vector too. Number two, uh, the vector C is perpendicular to both A and B. Now that's kind of crazy, right? Because let's say I have vector A right here, and here's vector B. Well, what vector is perpendicular to A? Well, it could be this way, right, like that. But that's not perpendicular to B. Well, it could be perpendicular to B, like that, but that's not perpendicular to A. So there's only one, there's actually two answers here. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and write this. Right hand rule. And this one is something that we're going we're gonna to practice. The only vectors that are perpendicular to both A and B are one, one that comes this way out of the paper, right? And one that goes into the paper. So a lot of times we're going to represent vectors in and out of the paper as this, as into paper. So it looks like an arrow, but you're looking at the back end of the arrow. Or this out of paper. So this looks like an arrow, but it's coming out of the paper. You're looking at the point. So here, coming in or out would both give vectors that are perpendicular to both of those, right? So let me just use this little cap right there. You can see this is perpendicular, and it is perpendicular to that too, and also the one that goes in. Now, how do we pick either one of those vectors? Now we use the right-hand rule. This is my right hand. So the right-hand rule says that the, res the resultant vector in or out um, would be such that if I let my, the fingers of my right hand cross through vector A and then B, the thumb of my right hand will point in the direction of the vector. So if I did this, then it would go through B and then A and it'd be up, and that's not what we want. If I did this, it would go through A and then B and so it would be down. So this one would be into the paper like that. Okay, we have one final thing about the cross product, and I'm gonna put it on a new piece of paper because I'm just running out of room. This one is uh, useful too. So here if I have F equals, let's do the other one. Uh, let's, no, no, C equals A cross B, that's what we said. So I can find the direction with the right-hand rule. The magnitude of this vector C is gonna be equal to the magnitude of the vector A times the magnitude of the vector B times the sine of theta, where theta is the angle between them. So if I have this is A, this is B, and that's theta, okay? And so you can see something really useful here. If theta is 90 degrees, then this is one. If theta is zero, then this is zero, which is kind of important because if I have the two vectors that are both in the same direction, like that, then theta equals zero, and you can't use the right-hand rule because which way do you cross, doesn't really matter. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring in my little toy here just because this is gonna be useful. Um, this is my right-hand rule Lego piece. I have red, white, and green, I made this. You can make your own uh, out of paper even, it, it, a lot of different things. But if I want to look at this as A cross B equals C, right, because this is double check, so this is uh, if I have my right hand go through A and then B, then that would be C. Now, let's go back to the definition of the magnetic force. F is QV cross B. So, if I want to call this QV and this B, then this would be F. Okay, And this is QV, not V. Because if, I have a, if, I, if the charge is negative then this will be in the opposite direction of the velocity, right? So that's important too. 
Okay, so that's the magnetic force on a on a point charge. And so I didn't show you how to do the magnetic force on a wire. Um, but I guess I will do that now. We It turns out that we can write this as, this is the way the book writes it, I, uh, L, cross B. So this is the magnetic force on a wire, and it's kind of a cheat because it assumes that the the length of the wire with respect to the magnetic field is constant. Uh, and, and that's not always the case, but you know we're gonna deal with this the simplest cases. So in this case, I times L is the same as Q times V. And this is the conventional current. So this is the direction that positive charges are moving if they would be moving. Um, okay. They do an, an example. Um, this is actually a pretty cool example. If you have this, this is a magnetic field that's going into the paper. Okay, so that's why I have the X's because they're like that. And let's say I have a positive charge moving this way. So velocity is that way. Well, which way would be the magnetic force on this? Well, if I, you know, I can use my little model here. QV is that way. Uh, B is into the board. So the force is going to be that way. Um, there, there's also a version of that that looks like this. This is QV this is B, and that would be the force. Q, V, cross B is force. So you can use this as a right-hand rule, and that helps out. You can put your fingers in the directions. But if I have the force this way, it's perpendicular to the velocity. If you remember from the previous semester of physics, when the force is perpendicular to the velocity, it causes the velocity to change direction, not magnitude. So now it'll be over here, but again, the force will be this way. And so the, the point is that this will cause the... Uh, charge to move in a circle in a constant magnetic field. And I'll do this as a problem, um, but that's not, let's not worry about that quite yet. Because it, it's a good example of a, of a practice problem. And it turns out that this is useful in a lot of different things, getting particles to move in a circle. If you wanted to store, let's just go ahead and say it, antimatter, and you don't want that antimatter to touch anything, you could put it in a constant magnetic field and make it move in a circle, and it won't have to touch the walls. Because if it did touch the walls, it would blow up, right? Um, they also give this idea of torque on a loop of wire. Um, so if you have a, a, a loop of wire with current I, 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 and then you have a magnetic field. We can find the force on each one of these wires and then use that to calculate the, the torque. They give this torque equals I, uh, or they give it as mu B. Let's get a new piece of paper. They say torque equals mu B sine theta. So Theta is the, this is kind of, here's my loop, and then this is my um, A vector, okay? It's a, it's a vector perpendicular to the plane of the, of the loop. I know that's kind of dumb. And then this is my magnetic field vector. The net force on this is going to be zero, but the torque is going to be this, where mu is I times A. Isn't that right? or n times times n, where that n is the number of loops. And that's the area. I, I, I'm not gonna get into that too much. And we will do this as a problem because I think it's a good problem. Uh, if we want to find the magnetic field due to a wire with the current I, uh, it's kind of hard to draw. So I'll just draw it this way. So it makes these loops around the wire. Let me draw the wire coming out of the paper like this then the magnetic field looks like this. It makes circular shapes around that, which is very different, that's B. And it does use the right-hand rule. So if you put your thumb in the direction of the, of the electric current, your fingers show the direction of the magnetic field. And the magnitude of that, B, is equal to mu naught I over two pi R where r is the distance from there, and mu naught is a constant equal to four pi times 10 to the negative seventh, uh, and the units are tesla meters per amp. They give also the equation for the magnetic field due to a, uh, 
a solenoid, which is actually useful in a lot of different ways. So if I have a solenoid is a coil of wire around a cylinder like this, the magnetic field inside is fairly constant and it has a magnitude of mu naught n i over l. So l is the length and n is the number of turns. But this is, this is important because it's kind of like the uh, capacitor version for magnetic fields. Remember in a capacitor or parallel plate capacitor, we had a constant electric field. This is how we make a constant magnetic field. Um, and then finally, the last thing is that uh, they talk about Ampere's law. We'll talk about that later. It's a little bit too complicated to talk about right now. I think the most important thing here, number one, uh, magnetic field. Number two, moving charges experience a force in a magnetic field. If they're not moving, they don't experience a force. And moving charges, electric currents, make magnetic fields. Okay, so it's all about moving charges. So charges make electric fields. Moving charges make magnetic fields. Charge in an electric field experiences a force. A moving charge in a magnetic field experiences a force. There's a whole bunch of great applications to this we'll talk about later, but that's the basic idea uh, here. Definitely look at the right-hand rule. Uh, we'll do some practice problems. There's a whole bunch of great applications. The end. I'm not too happy with this chapter, to tell you the truth. It's just, it's just a lot of great stuff, but the math gets really complicated for algebraic physics, so we just do the best we can.